Now, I wanted to uh, preface the, this, uh, this, um, this uh, title, Watershed as an Ecological Unit, creating context, because another way of looking at it is the old adage that when you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And I think the big issue we're dealing with now is a landscape that generates water, sometimes, and quite often lack of water, generates animal products, it generates forests, it generates all sorts of things, and things are changing and the things are getting more extreme. And the challenge is that when you don't understand your system, then you make decisions that may be good for one aspect, but may affect other aspects of your natural system and your, and your human-based system. So we developed and started working on watershed planning many years ago as a, as, a, as a tool to try to better understand how our systems were functioning so we could make educated wild ass guesses when it came to proper management. So the outline, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go over a little bit about uh, just why do we manage on a watershed basis, talk a little bit about it as, as an ecological unit. You'll hear me use the term context quite a bit because context is everything when you're dealing with complex systems. And we'll talk a little bit about the key elements of watershed plans and also a little bit about moving forward with watershed types of plans because watershed plans vary depending upon the scale of the system you're dealing with, the level of information you require, and so on. So it's sort of the other answer. You know, I'll, I'll mention another, uh, another little quote in a few moments. And the challenge is that we've all been here before. We've been here with when it comes to systems changing and adjusting, we learn from it and then we tend to forget. It seems to be about every 30 to 40 years we forget the, the science that we learned 30 to 40 years ago. And this is just a, a fun little cartoon from the uh, Carling Conservation Digest when Carling O'Keefe used to sell beer to a lot of outdoorsmen. They had a, had a journal. This is from 1947 and it shows Pine Creek in 1872, a beautiful little stream, forested landscape, trees, dicky birds, little critters flying all over the place and a young lad bringing home a nice stringer probably of brook trout. And there's the same young lad now in old cottage you're talking to his grandson saying when I was your age William a sparkling stream flowed here. What you see is the result of the destruction of the forests and the swamps. That was 1947. They already had the correlation between if we don't manage the landscape properly we change the water budget. When we change the water budget everything changes in the landscape. How can we keep forgetting this? I don't know. It's just a mystery of humanity that we have a tendency to have to rediscover things. What's the old adage about those that don't learn from their history are doomed to repeat it? Well, I don't want you folks up here to have to repeat the things that our forefathers did that, made, that created mistakes that we're trying to solve today. So another little quick, quick thing is that it, this is really important to everybody, this whole issue of watersheds. For example, if you go to BC, one day I was driving through Nelson and I noticed that they were fasting for watersheds. I thought that was absolutely amazing. And what was happening there was uh, there was a new forest uh, cut block proposed for the Slocan Valley, which is a tributary of the, um, of the Columbia through that area. And a whole bunch of folks chained themselves to the gate going into the um, cut block because they were worried about their, wa their water supply and worried about sediment going into the rivers and streams and affecting animal life. And when the, the uh, RCMP went to uh, arrest these folks, uh, there the, the two people that were chained, a man and a woman, they asked the man's name, he said, my name is Earth. They asked the woman her name, she said, my name is Water. So Earth and Water went to the pogi and everybody else fasted for them until they got out and were reprimanded. But anyway, it tells you people are passionate about their local landscapes and sometimes do interesting things in order to gain attention to them. The whole key is that people are trying to link themselves to their landscape and their watersheds. I call a watershed a, a form of an ecological unit because ecology is the relationship between the living and the non-living aspects of the landscape and how they interact together. So this is just a quick little, I call it the eco cube that was uh, generated by a guy by the name of Tim Allen quite a few years ago, talking about we can describe ecosystems by the pieces on the landscape, how those pieces are structured on the landscape, and how they interact with each other, the functions that they generate. So that's, so we look at landscape processes and then the communities that are responding to those processes and functions on the landscape. But somebody also once said that well ecology isn't rocket science, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, it's not physics. In physics you can write simple equations, relatively simple equations, and 
the systems follow that very clearly. But the trouble with eco ecosystems is there's a lot of feedbacks. And it base, it's also based on antecedent conditions. So it becomes more complicated. So we really have to try to understand all the different aspects of the system that are affecting us. That could be physical, chemical, biological, economic, and social. They all interact in, in various ways in order to create the systems that we're dealing with and the consequence of decisions we've made on the systems that we're dealing with. So what are we trying to do? Well, we're, try we're continuously trying to move towards what I call an ecosystem approach to management, which is basically trying to understand your system, defining your system in space and time based upon what the key questions are you're trying to deal with, trying to bound that in front of that system, bring the disciplines involved that interact at the physical, chemical, biological, social, economic, and try to figure out how the system works together so that you can better understand what you, you want out of the system and then how you put together plans at local levels, at, at regional levels, at provincial levels in order to ensure that you move towards those goals of a functioning type of system. And I stress that economics and social are part of the ecology because people do change landscapes. We change it for personal reasons, we change it for, for economic reasons. So we need to ensure that those systems are built into it as well. So we try to, as I said, this is just a summary of what I just said. We integrate this, we try to integrate the system, we try to understand the relationships, because ultimately what we're trying to do is build as much functionality into our systems. Functionality into the natural systems, functionality into the economic systems, functionality into the social systems that we're dealing with. The whole issue is context related to function. So we're, that's what we're trying for with the type, with the watershed type of planning as it's evolved. And I just want to mention that watershed pat, planning or catchment management planning started because the Thames River went septic back in the 70s and early 80s. And as a result, they put enormous time and effort into a catchment management plan for the Thames River in England. That plan is now 35, almost 40 years old, and it's still functioning. And that's why you now have Atlantic salmon running the Thames again, because they looked at the whole system, they put together hard evidence about what needed to be done. They had municipalities on board and municipalities enacted development proposals and management plans in order to clean the river up, make it functional not only for the animals that lived in that system, but for the people living adjacent to it. And we started to move in that direction in the um, late 80s, early 90s in Ontario as well, at least for about a decade. I threw this up because it's, watersheds are only one type of system that we can use. It all depends on what the, uh, the key question is. So if you're dealing with, uh, with, um, with only a lake basin itself, you may look at the basin and its, uh, its surrounding watersheds. If you're dealing with uh, what I call the eco-regions, if you're looking at biophysical relationships only on the land, you use the eco-regional eco approach and so on. So these are just different tools. Once I remember working in policy, working with the senior policy people at MNR quite a few years ago, they said, Jack, Jack, we have to choose. What are we going to use, eco-regions or watersheds when it comes to planning? And my simple question was, what's your question? What is the question you're trying to answer? Because that dictates the type of system you deal with. In your case, you're dealing to a large degree, especially as the last, the last few years, the, uh, the response of way too much water on the landscape and the impacts that it's had on communities, on your lake systems, and so on. So water is a logical thing because water is managed on the landscape. Much of the water that flooded this area flowed over and through the land before it got into the rivers. It came out of the sky. Much of it flew, uh, flowed through and over the landscape. Therefore, the landscape has a modifying effect on precipitation and how it's delivered into your rivers and your lakes. You need to look at that landscape. That's how you have to take a look at it. So what is a watershed? It's, uh, you already probably know this. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, bound, a landscape that's bounded by a height of land where all the water within that, that boundary drains into a common area, into a, into a common lake or river systems, and ultimately out to the ocean or into a great lake in our case. This is, I also use the term natural infra infrastructure. This is the type of natural infrastructure that we, we, um, that we are endowed with living in this area. We, we focus all the time on built infrastructure, and quite often our poor management of the natural in infrastructure puts the pressure on our roads, our culverts, and our dams that affects those built infrastructure. So we spend all our time fixing the built infrastructure without really thinking about 
how do we better manage that natural infrastructure so it doesn't put the pressure on our built systems? And I think that's another aspect of watershed planning is understanding those relationships that save you money and also make your systems more resilient. And resiliency is also another important terms when it comes to the future of watershed management in Ontario and elsewhere in the face of higher climate variability. Our systems are not as resilient as they used to be. How do we build resilience into them to manage water during high flow periods and also to hold water back during drought conditions to, uh, to moderate those negative impacts? How do we do that? You have to understand your watershed in order to figure out where the opportunities might lie. It all starts with geology. In this area here, you're dealing with a lot of uh, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the bedrock of the uh, Canadian Shield over, with a variety of types of overburdens left by the glaciers, large sand deposits, sand moraines, gravel moraines, and so on. Depending upon the depth of those moranic features on top of the bedrock dictates how well the landscape can hold water. If it's very shallow soils sitting on top of bedrock, then you get a fairly rapid response after heavy rainfall events. If you've got more large marine systems, perhaps you should be help allowing them to recharge to their maximum into those gravels and sands so that they release the water more slowly rather than flush it off the surface like we have a tendency to do when it comes to how we manage land. So geology does condition how water moves over through the landscape, conditions the chemical makeup, because the interaction of, this, of the of water with the soils generates a certain chemical found pattern. Up in this area, you're dealing with mildly acidic water because rainfall is usually at about 6, six to 6.5 uh, pH. You're dealing with gran granitic material that doesn't have a lot of natural al alkalinity, which means the water coming off is soft. In southern Ontario, where I spend more of my time, most of the world sitting on sedimentary rock, it's a lot of calcareous material. The water interacts with that, and our pHs of our rivers and our, our groundwater is around 8.2 to 8.4. Yours is around 6.5 or 6, or sometimes lower in the springtime. So all of these things are conditioned by the geology of the area, which is your first, first step in understanding your system, is understanding your geology. So we look at the large scale, but we don't understand this fine scale. And part of the difficulty with integration is trying to see the watershed in relationship to the site. I, I don't know about all of you, but most humans tend to be visual animals when it, try, it comes to trying to understand the system you're dealing with. So a visual animal will be standing beside a stream or a lake. They'll be looking at the repairing systems, the banks, the, the, the quality of the water, the color of the water, the clarity, the material on the bottom, maybe the critters that are around there, and so on. But that system is being dictated by the valley and the surrounding uh, hillsides that deliver water, sediment, and nutrients into that system. That valley is controlled, and the water getting into that valley system and into, down into the basin is controlled to a certain degree by how vegetation on the landscape modifies the water budget. The water budget generates on an annual basis how much water you get seasonally and what volumes and what, and what uh, duration and so on. And all of that is, has to go through and be conditioned by the geology. So you go from a broad scale to the fine scale, and from the fine scale to the broad scale to understand your system. And any watershed plan that you do deal with should help you build from a local area up to where the situation is starting. And then from the landscape, how that conditions the response at the local level. So you'll, you have to be looking in both directions and to understand that, which means getting the right professionals and scientists helping you with that. And all that links again at the, at the first level to the water budget. Now I can still say, I remember saying to somebody that when I was in school, the first time I ever heard anything called the water budget or the hydrologic cycle was when I was in high school. And now our kids are introduced to that in grade three, thank goodness. Because they do need to understand this because <laughs> we're made up of 65% water. So it's kind of important, but we take it for granted. But understanding how it gets into our systems, where it gets it, what proportion, when it falls from the sky, what proportion goes back up into the atmosphere, how is that changed, how much goes into the ground, how much over, runs over land, how much goes into the ground, comes out more slowly, how does that affect the channel structures you find, the receiving water bodies, the rivers and the lakes, lake basin levels, and how they fluctuate over the course of a year. All of that starts with understanding your water cycle. <clears throat> 
I threw this, this schematic a number of years ago because at one level you have the water cycle or hydrologic pathways for each watershed is different and each geographic, and I noticed geography and geographic uh, information was one of the key uh, objectives is trying to understand the geographic areas, the geological areas that are having major impacts on the, on the Muskoka region. Not all pieces of the landscape functions the same. As I said, if you have a large morantic feature or an area, you want to probably keep it treed because the, high, the, the trees help to allow for maximum infiltration in the springtime. If you call, call, clear cut all those trees off a major recharge area, they will regrow, but you'll have a change in the water budget for about eight to 10 years until those that vegetation grows big enough to start pumping water back into the atmosphere and allowing for infiltration to work properly. So you may have five or seven or eight years of which you're gonna have an increase in surface runoff, which will affect flood flows in your, your area. So there are things you can do with landscapes once you know how they function, which pieces function. On the other end is what's happening in the, in the bottom of the basin, in the lakes and the rivers that are flowing in through, the, through the valleys. Because that's where you have the ecological pathways of how water moves down into the valley, through the valley, how it interacts with the shoreline and the riparian area and its floodplains in the case of a large river, and how the groundwater interacts with the system. All of these are unique to each individual watershed. That's why I divvied up into two major pathways of understanding. So what are the impacts of changes in the water budget? Well, it can mean less infiltration and interflow, that's shallow groundwater, that has results in a concurrent increase in runoff. Uh, for example, in temperate forested areas, I can't speak for the Muskokas because every budget's slightly different, but in temperate areas like Southern Ontario, in a forested landscape, seven, about 70% of all the precipitation that falls from the sky is popped back into the atmosphere through evaporation or transpiration through the leaves. Trees are ma major water pumps. Uh, so if you take all the trees off that part of the landscape, you now have a surplus of water that's not going to evaporate or transpire. Where's it going to go? Some of it will infiltrate more actively. A lot of it will run off the land surface and now you have stormwater management issues if it's an urban area. Now you're having sun flashier flows coming down your systems which have an impact on your built infrastructure. So these are some of the elements of this. And again, they have major impacts on our built system when we change the hydrologic budget. Ecological pathways as well, we have major impacts. Um, for example, alterations in flow patterns affect the ability of animals to move up and down their systems and gain access to major reproductive areas and so on. For example, northern pike uh, spawn in the springtime, usually after ice melt, which is now changing uh, in time. But they, they usually are looking at flooded verges of wetlands in usually water that's less than 30 centimeters to 40 centimeters deep, flooded sedges and, and shrubs, and they, they, they spawn in those areas. But if you change when the water gets into those wetlands and the duration it gets into those wetlands, you've lost your pike population. So those interactions do occur. As well, at the, for example, you have drawdown here in, um, in a lot of your lakes in the, in the fall time, which is occurring right now. A lot of your, well, your lake trout populations are spawning in relatively shallow shoals that if you drop the levels too low after with the dams, you're going to expose those shoals and you're going to lose all your spawning habitat and spawning population of uh, lake trout. So that is an issue that relates to what's happening in this location here. So all of these interactions do occur over time. And again, you need to understand for your area how they interact. So each area is a little bit different. Land use then, of course, modifies all this sort of stuff. Uh, for example, when we deal with changes in water budget, we have major changes in a whole variety of things. We have changes in when the water is delivered, how quickly it's delivered, the quality of that water, the amount of sediments it carries, the amount of nutrients it carries out of those systems. All these result in, can change in changes in the nutrient cycling, and that's something that uh, Neil, uh, Neil Hutchinson, Dr. Hutchinson, does a lot of work on. Nutrient cycling, channel morphology, changes in lake water storage, changes in flood volumes and patterns, changes in seasonal lake levels, changes in temperature regime, and changes in habitat conditions. You know, ecology is not rocket science. It tends to be a little bit more complicated than that. There's a lot of stuff going on. Some of it may not be of interest or concern for us, but if we're concerned about other things around us, it may have a major impact. 
So what are the consequences of some of those changes? Just as a quick example, uh, would be uh, less, for example, if it's a river system, changes in flow patterns affects the channel morphology. Uh, I never heard of a field of science up until uh, about the early 70s called fluvial geomorphology. Try to say that three times really, really fast. There's also something called shoreline geomorphology or longshore geomorphology that we find in lake systems. And that's the action of how water moves sediment over time under certain conditions. And in our rivers, sediment transport and flood flows go hand in hand. And it's a sediment transport that helps it dissipate some of the water's energy. And it also is how it rebuilds its riffles and pools and moves and creates habitat for different animals. In lake systems, a longshore drift is another term, that's a geomorphic term, where the wave action actually moves particles along the shore, building up uh, points and bars or, or scr uh, scrubbing sediment from one location and depositing it in another. It's a field of science that's actually well understood. So channel morphology can change when that changes and then it changes all the aspects of the living space of the critters that are found there and can also change the characteristics of flood flows and channel stability, which may affect people's properties and built infrastructure. And again, from a habitat for the animals, it can change where their living space, how it's utilized, and, and, and their ability to reproduce and to provide nursery habitat for the animals. Further consequences of, for example, for lake storage and seasonal levels of alteration spawning habitat, that's what I mentioned about lake trout. If you drop the levels too low in the, in the fall, you may expose all your spawning shoals, which means you'll lose your lake trout populations. It also may alter the juvenile and rearing habitat for those animals depending upon the time of year and when they require higher float water moving into the margins versus lower water. The temperature regime can also have an effect now with cli higher climate variability. I mean, we've now had, what's it, 14 months of the highest monthly average temperatures in the world. I mean, that's a trend that's kind of worrisome. I mean, all you need is three data points for a trend. Now we have 14, and they're all going in a really bad direction. So temperature is going to be a big issue, especially when you link it to the nutrient cycling, because uh, especially up here, you've got a lot of folks with a lot of septic systems. I don't know how good those septic systems are. Some of them may be really good. Some of them may not be so good. And what we're finding, especially with smaller northern lakes that have cottages and other sorts of nutrients, is we're starting to see more and more incidents of blue-green algae blooms. Now, blue-green algae is really kind of interesting because it generates a really a neat set of toxins that can't be taken out by just simply boiling the water, and they can kill things. Um, way down south in New Dundee, Ontario, as a tributary called Alder Creek flows into Nith, uh, they had a blue-green algae bloom about eight, nine years ago, quite, quite a bad one, and I think half a dozen horses died because they were just drinking the water out of the reservoir. So if you take your water out of the lake and you have a blue-green algae bloom, you may have some challenges. So you, you need to watch out for that sort of stuff. It's not happening right now around here, but the trends are becoming more marked in other parts of the province. So we need to figure out a better way of managing. And we need to bring the professionals to, together to integrate their understanding so that we can understand the relationships between the disciplines and the systems themselves and how they're working. So we're trying to link that watershed uh, its natural system to how we use it. We're trying to understand how it's connected to the lake basin, how those tributaries way up. For example, the Oxtongue River way, the heck up in Algonquin Park, has an impact on flood flows that eventually come down here into uh, Lake of Bays. We're look, trying to understand how we, what type of tools we require, what type of management plans we require that are not just municipal plans within the municipality, but plans for how we look at uh, uh, management of those forested areas, management of our wetlands. What wetlands have you lost that might be storage areas for future floods? What are the system, how is your system functioning? What tools that you want to put in place to better create higher levels of resilience? The last item that I put in here goes down to, I think, one of the goals of the of, um, of, uh, of the new initiative here, and that is linking knowledge to social learning. Ultimately, any plan is only as good as the community, community's input into it and the community's understanding of the plan and the science behind it. 
Kevin mentioned the, um, the first watershed, sub-watershed plan we did in Southern Ontario was on Laurel Creek uh, uh, in Waterloo. And what was quite amazing is it was a, it was a one and a half, almost two year process. At the end of it, the, as, one, as the mayor, uh, Mayor Turnbull at the time told me, he said, well, on one hand, we have the, what he called the eco-nuts, the guys that were going to chain themselves to all the trees to protect all the trees in the watershed. Uh, the other hand was the Urban, De Urban Development Institute that felt all the land should be developed. And he said, and everybody in between, he said, I can't believe it, Jack. We've just finished this, plan this process. They've got all the information, and they're all agreeing with each other. He said, there's something horribly wrong here. <laughs> It took council 25 minutes of discussion to implement, to accept the watershed plan and build it into their um, secondary plan because the community was on board, because the community understood it, because the community had been involved at key points all the way along with all the information presented to them and showing how the relationships work and why the recommendations for planning and moving forward were established. They bought into it and then they pushed council to move it forward. That's what you ultimately want here, is to have the community, the people that live here, to understand it and to understand the consequences of doing it right and the consequences of perhaps not doing all the things they could do. Everybody has to understand those consequences. Whether they choose to do that, so is another matter, but at least they understand. So, things are complicated. And this is my other fun quote that I love. Complex problems often have easy to understand wrong answers. You just have to look at the U.S. right now to understand that. We have a lot of complicated things that we deal with in life. If it was easy, somebody else would have figured it out years ago. A lot of these issues are complicated. They require good information and discussion and debate and better understanding in order to solve them. So problem statements, I, when I think about actually trying to implement things, why are we trying to implement things? Well, first of all, we see constantly getting new issues. And all the issues we're dealing with becoming more and more complex. We're often finding that simple solutions solve one problem, but then create half a dozen other problems because we're, again, thinking of it as a single, single solution. We're getting more and more government policies coming up. The reason I put all these up, in, uh, up here is because I, have, I was asked by one person, this is what we're doing some brainstorming about um, early mid-90s with our senior policy people in MNR saying we need to figure out what the ne next big set of issues are that we have to develop policy for. And I was trying to explain to him it all depends on your context. So I was trying to figure out an, ex an analogy for contextual understanding. And I realized that the perfect uh, explanation was at Victoria Day, when you have all the fireworks, and one of the types of fireworks that kids like is that spinning wheel. You like the wheel and the sparks go off and it spins faster and faster and faster. Well, issues are the sparks. The trouble is that we have a tendency to try to catch the sparks rather than addressing the wheel. What is creating all those different issues? We have to understand the context. So the answer was we have to realize the wheel is the context, not the, context, not the sparks. We address the wheel. In our case, the wheel is the watershed. So you got to understand that a lot of the, not all, but a lot of the big issues you're dealing with are as a result of changes in the different aspects of the watershed, how we've used it in the past, how we're using it currently, in relationship to higher variability. And once we understand those relationships, then we can create better plans and management plans to help try to address it, rather than saying we have big flooding, we have to put berms up. Well, maybe berms are part of a solution. It may be not the biggest solution. It may be something to help the folks that are there right now, but we're still developing. We're still doing other things on that on the watershed and other parts of the, land, of the, of the shoreline. You have to make sure that you address all the future aspects as well. So we need to figure out the wheel, not the, not the sparks. Watershed planning has evolved. Back in the 80s, we did simple things like uh, floodplain mapping and floodplain management. And then we, back in the early 80s, late 80s, early 90s, we got into more modern things. We started looking at mul multiple tiered municipalities. We started looking at, well, water quality is important as well as water quantity. And then we started working on aquatic uh, environments and saying, well, geez, we're, we're losing a lot of our, 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 our fish, our wildlife that live in these areas. We need to start in, including wildlife and fish and fisheries and water quality and quantity. And then we started thinking, well, what channel morphology, lake basin management. We worked our way up 
up and up and up, we started to start to see that eventually we started to get, look at the whole watershed as the context. And that took, well actually up to the mid 90s is when we started to realize that we needed to really build this in in order to under, better understand how we want to move forward. And the province stressed the fact that what we're trying to ultimately do, that little squiggle there in the middle there, that's a, that's a little mini watershed. It's sort of sitting there and over time, its health and its, its resilience has sort of deteriorated as different, as, as we came in after and uh, sort of partially displaced uh, indigenous folks. We started to utilize the landscape a little bit differently than they did. We started to clear the forest for farming. We dammed a lot of the rivers for hydropower because it helped to build our economy. But at the same time, the consequences were the system changed over time. We're at a point now where we can choose the trajectory of where we want our watershed to go. We're not victims to a, a decline. Yes, things have declined in many cases, but we're not victims to that. As long as we have good information, we can make better decisions and we can change the trajectory. And that's where I, I say you're at a very lucky point right now where you have some funding and support to try to move your trajectory to, our, to your watersheds of the Muskoka's to figure out where do you want it to go. Because ultimately, having a real clear goal on the system is going to help you move more effectively forward in that direction. If you don't have a goal, you get back to that old adage of when you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So this is where we say that you do have a choice when it comes to the trajectory. And again, you need that contextual understanding. You need to understand form of the system and its function. You get into that composition, structure, and function thing. You need to understand what's causing things rather than, in fact, I teach a course on watershed and stream rehabilitation uh, across Canada. And one of the key things we say is you treat the cause of the problem, not the effect. Sometimes you can't deal with the cause, you have to deal with the effect. But ultimately, you want to figure out what is the cause of all this, the problems I'm facing and try to address that. Again, nobody said it was going to be easy, but with good information and a community that understands the consequences of not doing it well, you'll have a better chance of moving to solving the cause of your problems. You want to understand then, for each solution you generate, what are the consequences of your various management outcomes. Are they helping you move in the trajectory you want? Are they not helping you move in the trajectory you want? And then you want to have the full breadth of possible options ahead of you. I can still remember a good friend of ours, John Plank. Kevin remembers John. John, uh, one time I was saying to, uh, to John, John, we have to take people out, ask them what they want. And he looked at me and said, how can you ask somebody what they want unless you tell them the whole thing, all the breadth of what they could have? I thought, well, what do you mean? He said, well, most people grow up in a certain community, a certain area. They see certain things, and they figure that's the limits of things that they could have. But maybe that may not be the case. With better information, you might find that the breadth of things they could have is this, but they're used to this. So you need to show them what they could have in order to make a better decision of what they want. This gets back to the social learning, and one key aspect of well-run watershed planning is engaging the community with all your information step by step to show them the relationship so they can start to understand what they could have and ex should expect. So that gets into the whole idea of the full breadth of opportunities. It's not as though we haven't been here. Now, myself, Don Greer, Fred Johnson, and about three other people with the Ministry of Environment worked for about five years to develop this planning process for watershed planning in Ontario. We have these documents are all still around, and I actually all have them all on uh, as digital copies if you guys don't have them. Um, and they guided our watershed planning. We did over 180 watershed sub watershed plans in, in Ontario between 1989 and 2000. Things got stalled by the mid to late 90s uh, because of down, downsizing of government. We got stalled and then we eventually sort of wandered away from watershed planning because there was no money for it anymore in government. But those initial watershed plans moved us enormously forward with the number of the watersheds we dealt with. The city of Waterloo is still implementing the Laurel Creek sub-watership plans, which identified all the standards for, for development. It told them where they could develop, where they needed special approaches for development, and where more general uh, layout for development could occur. Those are being respected, and also identified 
how they had to put the developments in and their standards. And what the developers told us is it makes it a lot easier for me to know exactly what you want up front rather than trying to second guess it through the, through the approval process piecemeal, bit by bit by bit. As a matter of fact, our, some of our strongest allies with the Watership Planning in Waterloo were the developers who saw that once and for all they had an upfront plan of where they could develop and how and what their standards were. They didn't have to second guess everybody. So it saved them money, which meant that they were a bit more generous about doing other good things as well. So what are we trying to do ultimately? We're ultimately trying to manage human activities and natural systems within a defined unit, which we're calling an ecological or geophysical unit, we're calling it a watershed. We're accounting for spatial and temporal planning skills. Planning, oh, I thought I left one end out of planning. Because we're looking at not only what we're doing today, but the planning that we likely will see in the future and how that's going to transpire. We're looking at relating where the water comes off, falls from the sky, how it goes through over and through the landscape, how it's modified, where we can adjust it if need be to moderate things, and where we can't. In some cases, you cannot adjust things because you only have so much geology, surface soils, and so on to work with. But also, it strives to look at how we create plans and policies for sustainability so we don't have to worry constantly about impacts on our built infrastructure, we reduce the impacts on water quality, we have careful development, we look at restoring parts of the landscape to rebuild resilience and functional features. We recognize that things are complicated, but we have the information that shows how they relate to each other so people can make rational decisions and weigh which, how far they want to go in which direction in order to achieve certain things. And you've integrated all those scientific information so it's available and and, 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 and defensible as well, and when it comes to that. You also identify which agencies are responsible, because not municipalities can't do this all. There's a very big role for the province in this, and perhaps a certain role for the federal government. Also, for the, from a standpoint of development, it creates standards and locations for development, and ultimately tries to strive, as I said, for that engaged community. In the last five minutes, five, five more minutes? Five, eight more minutes? Okay. So what are we trying to ultimately integrate? We're trying to integrate a process. So first of all, we're trying to understand how all this technical stuff links together. The anal we're going to analyze it. So you're looking at engineering, geomorphology, hydrogeology, hydrologists, water quality specialists, forest, forest specialists, and so on, working together to tell you, here's how we can work on this. Then you're looking at lake uh, limnologists to try to understand how your system's functioning, how the water levels are, are affected by with different types of inputs from different parts of the watershed. So you're not only integrating the science, you're also integrating the disciplines, having them talk to each other. There's nothing, I, and I, the first number of studies I ever did is the hydrologist gave his report, the hydrogeologist, the groundwater person gave his report, the geomorphologist his, the water quality guys, and they had, it was all standalone. You say, well, how does it interact? So we forced all those guys and gals into one room for about four days and said, show us how it links together. It took them four or five days, and then all of a sudden they started thinking about it themselves. And in the future, and other future watershed plans, they already were starting to talk to each other about this sort of stuff, and gave, got, they each got new understanding of the other disciplines and how it was affecting their, their uh, type of focus, and they were able then to help adjust and have everybody else understand the focus and how things were functioning at a more integrated standpoint. As one, some, somebody once said, it's one system. We just, from a scientific standpoint, point tend to divide it into disciplinary lines and then forget to put it back together again. So part of watershed planning is integrating that understanding and bringing the common vision to, a, to the purpose. Also that institutional understanding so that we are making the best decisions based on the best evidence possible. Whether you choose to go so that far in one direction or this far in another is up to the community and to, to its elected officials, but at least you know the consequences of moving this way versus this way and how far, and you can balance those needs in amongst your, the economic social aspects of your community. And finally, you're integrating a view so that the vast majority of the community, the cottagers, the people that live here, the people from away, start to understand how your system functions and the rationale behind the decisions you're making. So they're understandable, so that there's li li limited confusion. If they want to argue with you, they can argue with the science. 
and that's, a, that's fine too. But at least there's something you're stacking up your decision making because the community also understands. So the, the left is the, is the general stuff of the state of the science. The right uh, on this, the application of science, these are the steps we cut off and take with watershed plans. We characterize our landscape, our watershed. We then start to utilize the, the tools to understand and predict different responses based upon how we understand the system. We then determine what our issues are and how those issues are created by the by how the system is functioning and how people are using, using, using it. And we try to make up rational decisions based upon those issues. We communicate that information. We make decisions. And I, ultimately, we decide what we need to monitor to determine whether our decisions were the good ones. Because all of these plans still every five to 10 years should be reviewed at least at a certain level to determine whether you're still on the right trajectory, the one that you've chosen. So in summary, there are a lot of tools out there already. I think uh, Don Greer, before he retired from the Ministry of Natural Resources, worked very hard to develop a water budget tool for the province that helps people to, to develop a water budget for each of their watersheds. So that water budget tool is still available. We have phosphorus modeling and nutrient input models, which especially for your lakes and the water quality of your lakes is going to be critically important to understand. We have, in many cases, seamless surface of water and groundwater modeling that's been developed, at least in the south. I'm not sure how well it might apply here, but I, you've got there are that modeling. Uh, the nodes for that expertise is, uh, has been out of the University of Waterloo over the years with their Center for, gra for Groundwater Research. Uh, there are governance structures, and community-based involvement is also a critical component. And when I say involvement, I don't mean consultation. I mean involvement. I mean, actually talking to folks, explaining things, hearing their input, trying to demonstrate what the science is saying and getting their response to it and trying to f have everybody understand everybody's perspective. And finally, trying to figure out what the enabling legislation is that you have. Because one of the things that I really firmly believe in is that if we only f focus on a regulatory approach, Regulatory approaches are based on the minimum standard. I once said to somebody, you can take a pristine environment and, take, and apply all your minimum standards, you'll have a minimal environment at the end of it. So the regulation is a good friend of mine. I'm also an adjunct through the School of Environmental Design and Rural Planning at Guelph, and I spent a lot of time with, with um, policy guys. And, and their comment was, when it comes to uh, resource and environmental management, your last recourse is regulation. Your first recourse is, a, is an involved and committed community that understands the science and information and can make good decisions, better decisions than your minimums. And then for those poor actors, you have regulation as your backstop. These days, we've downsized government rules so much that all we have left are regulations, and they're not going to get us where we want to go. They'll help a little bit, but they'll only slow the slide down. So we need things that enable people to do a better job than the minimum, which means we have to move towards an outcome-based management. Here's where we want to go. Can you help us get there? Here are the standards that we want to get to, not the ones we have right now. Can you help us as you put your development in, get to that location? Those are the types of approaches we need. Otherwise, that trajectory may not be going in the right direction. When it comes to the communities, a good uh, friend of mine, Steve Bourne, uh, this is a quote, it's kind of wordy, true protection and restoration of natural environments will not occur until we engage those with whom we would not normally associate. This sounds like Facebook. Uh, Facebook has taken that to the extreme where they all, they, their algorithms determine what type of person you are and the types of things that you agree with and they link you only to people that agree with you. That's really a difficult way to really solve problems. So we really need to figure out what are those folks that don't necessarily agree and bring them in, have those difficult conversations with information and science and data to figure out how we better improve things. Because once we do that, then we move forward more quickly. And again, that plan has to be both for the people and its resource. The best planning I've ever done was a plan where at the end of it, the community said to me, thank you for helping us, helping develop our plan. Can you guys from the agencies now help us implement it? That's when we all did a high fives in MNR and conservation authorities because actually it was their plan, not our plan. It was the plan of the community based upon the best science we were able to provide them. We gave them all the data, the information, and you know what? Nine times out of the ten they came to the same conclusion that we did. But it was their plan, 
because they understood it and were recommending it. And then they help implement it. And they still are. That was uh, the, one of the major fish plan on the Grand. It's still going 15 years later with all the uh, actors around the table still implementing it as it goes. So these things are really important because it ultimately becomes a people's plan. And that hopefully will be what you guys end up with through this process is a people's plan based on the best information available and an understanding of the consequences of the different courses of action and how far people wish to go with those things. And I, years ago, we had this argument with uh, Municipal Affairs who said, you guys are setting up a watershed planning process that's, that's in conflict with the, uh, with, the, with the municipal planning process. And I said, how can this possibly be? All we're doing at certain points is giving you better information in order to make a decision on what your municipal plans should look like. So this, we came up with this. So the watershed plan starts, provides uh, at a very coarse level of information that goes into your official plan. That official plan feeds back into the next level, the finer level of planning that goes in at more local level within a specific municipality. Figures out what they could have to get you towards your municipal official plan, which is also understands how the watershed functions. That gives you your secondary plan and so on. So they interact with each other all the way down the line. One providing information to the other. One more science-based, the other more community and politically based. But ideally, you're trying to get the best outcomes possible for the community and for the environment you live with. So this is where we tried to demonstrate the municipal affairs. Twelve years later, the same person that was yelling and screaming at us about how this was contradicting the, fish, uh, the, uh, the planning process sat up in front of another workshop about watershed planning and saying, watershed planning is our savior. And uh, I thought, well, at least you got religion. But it only took her 15 years. But anyway, it's good. It sometimes takes, some people take longer. But she understood that there was actually input to it. It was not instead of, of municipal planning, it was an aid to good, sound, long-term municipal planning and implementation. So what are the outcomes we're trying for with this watershed? We're trying to rebuild our natural infrastructure to support the built infrastructure and the communities that live within that built infrastructure. In many cases, I say here, it's unrealistic. Somebody said, well, are you dealing with restoration, restoring the landscape back to its original form? Hell no, there's too many of us. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's too many people on the landscape. What we're trying to do is make it as functional as possible given the tools and the natural features of the landscape that we're dealing with and how far we can restore those features to get the functions that we want. We're trying to get as functional a state for the people and the environment. We're not trying to turn the clock back to 1750. We need that, in order to get that, we still need that integrated approach. We need it to be outcomes based because we want to urge developers and others to try to see if they can achieve more than the minimum standards that are expected as a, as a base minimum for managing landscapes. And we really want to get away from that piecemeal approach where we're fixing one little problem here, but that exacerbates problems elsewhere. Somebody asked me, well, where, does, where do the various types of, uh, what type of tools come out of watershed planning? These are all the tools. These are all the different plans that can be then finalized out of a good solid watershed plan. For example, one of the things you're working on right now is water management plan. That's only one of the elements that comes out of all of the different tools that can be generated from a watershed plan because it's contextual. It gives you information that can then be modified and adjusted for specific purposes, whether it's natural heritage systems, built infrastructure, lake development, growth projections, um, if you're dealing with aquatic ecosystem management, trying to look after the critters that live in your rivers and streams, forest management, biodiversity, they're all linked to sound understanding of your system. And they can vary. All watershed plans vary. The costs vary depending upon the scale, the spatial scale you're dealing with, and the level of detail required. If you're looking at a small plan of subdivision in a local creek, an overall large-scale watershed plan may be not detailed enough. It may be detailed enough to tell you what the, the issues are you're going to deal with at a local level on one small section of shoreline or river system. It won't tell you all the information, not at that level of detail. So you have it nested. First, do your watershed plan, then you identify where you need finer tuning plans for because you've got major development or development pressures in those local areas. But again, it provides a variety of tools for, for, the, for the municipalities, 
for the for the uh, for the legis uh, le legislators and others to make sure that you're trying to create as resilient a system as possible. And given the higher variability we're dealing with right now, we need a system that's a, as resilient as possible as our first backup. We'll still have to do a lot of work to, um, to adapt to things that are happening, but at least building the natural infrastructure and making it as resilient as possible is going to save you money in the long term. It's money in your pocket. And finally, just want to say that I love this paraphrased quote from Einstein, we can't solve today's problems with the same level of thinking that created them. And the trouble is we have a tendency to use the same thinking to solve new problems. Thanks very much.